Hello, hello, hello. Good afternoon. Hope everybody's having a good Sunday. Hope you got some shop time in. Oh boy, things have been going crazy as usual back here behind the scenes. I'm uh, trying a new layout here. My uh, friend and CNC guru, Dave Gatton, basically convinced me to try dual displays. So it's a it's it's not going to make a heck of a lot of difference to you, but it's different for me because <laughs> when I go to screen share Aspire, I had that whole tunnel vision thing all of a sudden pop up, and uh, hopefully now that won't happen when I screen share because I have a second monitor over here off to the side. So it's going to look kind of weird for you in that. Instead of looking straight ahead, I'm going to be looking over this direction to see the other monitor when I'm working in the spire. But hey, we'll get we'll get by. Um, I've got some other stuff happening behind the scenes here. Uh, it's an absolute mess. <laughs> Still, I am gearing up for next week's video. Uh, I've got the walnut panels. Uh, glued up that's this is the back of the t-shelf and um, uh, all the rest of them are over here getting ready to actually cut this thing out and uh, get it going so hopefully that will be next week's video I'm not 100% certain it's just going to depend on how things go now, as part of that, um, this opens up an opportunity to make another video, but I was going to ask you about it, and I will put it also over on the community tab on my uh, YouTube page. Um, I'm going to, I've got some panels here that are glued up, but, whoops, will need to be surfaced. As you can see, I've got some nicks in my planer knives and where they were joined together are not exactly even. So that brings about um, the subject of surfacing on a CNC. I can do a video on it if you think it's important. If you don't think it's important, meh, um, then I won't bother doing a separate video on it. But for those of you who have asked about the difference between setting the Z0 in Aspire over in Job Setup, setting it to the machine bed versus setting it to the top of the material, that'll introduce that. And it will basically, I'll have to set my Z0 to the machine surface in order to machine the material down to a specific thickness. If that's something that you're interested in, I'll go ahead and do a video on it. If it's not anything that you're interested in, then I won't bother. So, you know, um, Aaron Powell talking about what if the board is on level when going onto the board, I guess you're talking about onto the spoil board and that's a part of it. Um, if it's not level, if it's twisted or cupped or something like that, I'll have to shim it to be able to get one flat surface and, um, then flip it over and then surface it to thickness from there. So, when I ran these through the planer, I, you know, kept them a little bit fat. I want to plane down to half inch thick, but I'm going to plane down to that half inch thick on the CNC. I'm not, I didn't do it on the planer. I ran them to about half inch thick would be 0.5 inches. I ran it to about 0.6. So I've got you know, a hundred thousandths of an inch. Let me convert that to metric. Um, or our metric friend. 
that would be uh, roughly two, about two and a half millimeters um, thicker than I need it to be so that I can flatten and then, um, and then surface it down to the final thickness. Also, this is reclaimed walnut flooring. So it's not the prettiest walnut in the world. And grain goes in several directions at the same time, uh, especially around, I mean, they left knots in it and they left a whole bunch of stuff. So the um, basically running it through the planer, you can't guarantee that you're running it through the, in the correct direction. So you're going to get chip out and tear out and everything else running it through a planer, surfacing it on a CNC with the surfacing bit eliminates a lot of that chip out because it's a radial cut versus a, I guess you'd call it a linear cut. So, okay. Um, I see, I see nothing but positives over here. So I will do that then. Uh, but that will be a separate video after I have this completed. So I'll, I'm shooting footage as I'm doing this. And that's why I say, I think it'll be next week's video. Cause I think I'll have it finished by then. We'll see. Um, if I do get it finished, that'll be next week's video. If I don't get it finished, then it'll be the week after that. But basically it'll be in two parts. One will be just surfacing to get a smooth finish. And then the second part, it, it'll all be one video, but uh, surfacing one side to get a smooth surface, then flipping it over and surfacing to a, a known thickness. So we'll do that. Okay. All right. <laughs> um, had a couple of questions this morning on um, YouTube stuff and display stuff and what have you. Uh, and I'll, I'll go ahead and go through this just simply because um, uh, Jim Brown asks, um, let's see here, here it is. Um, don't know if it's my eyes or my computer, but when I screen share, it's so blurry, he can't read it. Just a heads up. When, okay, when I set this up in StreamYard, this camera and the level of plan that I have purchased through StreamYard will only broadcast in 720p. It's a 720p camera, and it's, it's not all that good. It's my shop camera. I will eventually upgrade to a uh, 1080p camera, but right now my StreamYard will only go out in 720p. So when I set it up in StreamYard, and we go live here on YouTube, YouTube sets it automatically to 720p because that's what StreamYard told it to do. Well, sometimes YouTube's auto 720p or 1080p isn't all that good. Um, I won't say it, it actually puts it out in a lower resolution, but it it, for some reason, it, it, it doesn't quite, not always, but it, it doesn't quite look all that good. So if you go down into the video panel there on the YouTube page and you kick, click the gear and then look at quality, it'll say auto 720p or what have you. Well, click 720p again and it'll refresh the pane and it should be a lot clearer. Now, um, I haven't had any real issues in 720p. I understand that 1080p is much, much more desirable, but this old camera and StreamYard both conspiring against me <laughs> won't let me do it. So um, refresh by clicking that gear and then clicking on quality and setting it to 720p yourself. Uh, that'll force YouTube to refresh the uh, feed on your browser, and it should be a lot clearer. Um, the other question that I had was about my scheduling. 
and that was uh, Thomas Grimm um, said, okay, here we go. Uh, for me, Dave's Saturday night show, he's talking about my friend and guru, Dave Gatton. Uh, his Saturday night show appears in YouTube well ahead of time. Yours appears in Facebook with the randomness of the Facebook al algorithm. Uh, it opens in YouTube if it appears. Um, can you find out how he gets it up in advance? And that's just simple scheduling. He will schedule his live streams long before I do. And uh, he usually, he does a live stream on Saturday night, and then he schedules his next live stream that Monday. I wait. I, I schedule my live streams usually on Thursday before I go live. This week, Comedy of Errors, I didn't get it scheduled until Friday. So that's why it appeared a little bit later. He also will promo his live streams over on Facebook and Instagram and Twitter at the same time he sets up his live stream on Monday. I don't do that. I promo the live stream on Sunday morning when I get up, had some coffee and can see. And um, I promote it that day. That way it's closer to the top of your feed. It's less likely to get missed and it's easier to find. So that's why you're seeing his promos earlier than mine. And I'm going to continue to do it that way. It's been working for me so far. Um, the other part about it is um, he asked why he didn't see the upcoming live stream on YouTube when he went to my YouTube page. I don't know if YouTube will let me put upcoming live streams on my YouTube homepage. I haven't found the control to do that. I do know the live stream will appear on my YouTube page after we go live. But before we go live, I don't think there's any way that I can put it up there. Uh, I'll look into it, though. But generally speaking, I... I set up the live stream on the Thursday before I go live. So it'll be closer to the top of your subscription feed. And I don't promo it on Facebook or uh, Instagram until that Sunday morning. That way it's closer to the top of your timeline and you can find it a heck of a lot easier. Okay. So I think that's all the inside baseball stuff and behind the scenes stuff, but I'm not 100% sure if anything else let you know when we get there. <laughs> so, all right, let's see here. Let's get into the questions that you have put into the chat so far. Uh, let's see here now. Brooks says, I got into node editing or mode editing during node editing, okay, a Bezier segment where the node and the two arcs get highlighted. I thought the node could be selected individually. They can. Sometimes you have to zoom in pretty close because if you select the node, now if you select the node on the Bezier curve, it should highlight the two handles. Let me um, get over into Aspire here, and here is where we will check out and see if this works. And I should be sharing. Hey, there is my Aspire screen. Okay, I'll come over here and let's draw a, is that a Bezier? I think that's, a, no, that's an arc. Close that. I don't want to do an arc. I want to do a curve. All right, so we'll create a Bezier here and accept that now. I'll go back to regular selection mode, select it, tap in to go into node editing. Now, if I select this node, for example, it does select those two handles. And that's just to let you know that these two handles are active with that node. So I can 
go in and pull and move things around. So now let's see, click off, click back on it. And without selecting the node, I can just adjust the handles independently. Okay. So if you select the node, it will activate the two handles. But if you just go over to a handle and adjust it, it will let you adjust the handle individually. Is that what you were asking about uh, there, Brooks? Is that a little bit... Um, let me stop sharing here and get back over. Is that more or less um, what you were asking about? Okay, perfect. I see your answer to that. Yes, uh, so it, it, it's just the difference between... Um, it's, it's just the difference between selecting the uh, node versus just adjusting the handles. Uh, okay, and the follow-up with that is I found I could deselect the handles with the shift key. Yes, yes. Holding, holding, the, um, holding down the shift key will let you add or let you select more than one node or more than one... Uh, vector and or deselect certain objects or vectors or handles, etc., etc., etc. So, okay, uh, let's see. Let's go back to another question here. And we have Jack Matson says, "In Aspire, is there a way to extrude a portion of a design and make file, such as a portion?" of a sailboat in a file. Um, there are multiple ways of doing things like that. Um, boy, um, there are, let's see here. Um, let me go back over to, come on. Yeah, it's a little bit confusing until I get used to. <laughs> the two monitors okay there we go we're sharing again i'm gonna use just a piece of clip art um i do have a couple of things from design and make but um let's see what we have over here in the clip art that could be a good representation okay uh let's do this one all right this is fish and shellfish okay now if i for instance just wanted this crab what i could do is come over here and i'll do a circle around the crab here and that's not a very good edit point, but whatever. Um, it's it's a start, and I could refine this a bit later on. Close that, then come over here to modeling, select the model, hold down shift, select the vector, and come up here and clear the area of selected component outside the vector. So if I click that, go into my 3D view, it's only got that portion selected. Go over to my 3D view now, and I can refine further from there. So that's one way of clearing out part of a model that you don't intend to use. Now, obviously, I can come back in a little bit, get rid of that vector now. And then, um, whoops, select and trace. Well, that didn't work. Um, I would have to go in and on this do a trace around the crab, for instance, if I wanted to just use that crab. So, and then 
select that vector and clear everything outside of it. So I hope that answers that question. Uh, if that's not what you were talking about, please uh, let me know. And uh, I'll try to do what I can for that. Uh, let me get back over here to live questions. Was that... Uh, was that more or less what you were talking about? Um, is it possible to export the shellfish so I can modify it with Rhino? If you have a spire, yes. And I've done a video on that on how to export clip art. Um, and I, if you have a spire, you can export to an STL file. Um, I did a video on that. Um, and I will link it in the description of this video as soon as we get done live here. Um, and um, it's fairly simple in Aspire, but that option is not available in VCard. Okay. So I uh, do know that. Uh, let's see here. Let me get back over here to my other questions. And let's see. Caroline Roth wants to know, do you have to purchase the VCarve software to be able to save and upload a file to run on the Onefinity? The short answer is yes. You cannot generate G code from the trial version with exceptions what you need to do is go to vectrix website and create a v and company account you go to their main website and you'll see log in to v and company then click on that link you'll create a v and company account and from there you can go into their past projects and look for the past projects, they'll have a little blurb somewhere, either in the thumbnail or in the title description of their projects that says trial version friendly or trial compatible. And what that is, is you can download that project and, you know, make any modifications or um, change the tool paths to match your machine and your tools and what have you. Those files, you can save G code and take that G code out and cut it on the machine. They want you to see the workflow and how it works, but there are, and not every free project is trial compatible, but a lot of their more popular projects are. For instance, the uh, Paradise Box. I think it's a rite of passage. It's kind of almost an unwritten law that if you have a CNC router and you get Vectric software, you almost have to make a Paradise Box. Um, I made one. I don't have any pictures of them here on this computer or I'd show you. I made one for each of my granddaughters and for Christmas in 2015 and they absolutely loved them. They really freaked out over them. It's, I would say that's easily Vectric's most popular project of their free monthly projects. But again, you have to go ahead and create a V and company account and then go into their project of the month and go way back and you'll find that paradise box project. Uh, but there are a whole bunch of other projects on there and um, all designed by Michael Tyler. He's very talented, very good. And um, basically just give it a good go. And that will get you in the door and let you decide, um, let you decide whether the uh, Vectric software is is a a good match for you, but um, other than that, yes, you do need to purchase the uh, the software. 
So let's see. Let's go. I hope that answered your question. So let's go back over here and see what the next question is. Okay. Robert Dymock says, since I was silly and injured my hand, it is hard to put a mill into the spindle. Okay. Could I attach a magnet to the mill and use it to temporarily hold the mill until I can tighten the collar? Whatever works. Something else I've seen people to do, Robert, is put the mill into the collet and then, you know, put, bring their Z down until the end mill is touching the spoil board and then bring it down a little further until that's inserted all the way, then tighten it, then lift it up, obviously, and go away. In fact, um, my uh, a, a, a guy I follow over in Australia, um, I've mentioned him before on this channel, uh, John with uh, Labels Extreme. That's how he sets his Z0 on his tiny, tiny bits. He uses some that are, you know, quarter millimeter diameter and smaller to cut mother of pearl for making inlays for guitar fretboards. And these bits are so delicate, you cannot use a touch plate because just coming down and touching that touch plate, it'll shatter the bit. And he buys these bits in 10 packs because he knows, like for instance, one of my favorite videos of him was a uh, ebony um, fretboard and guitar body, believe it or not, that he came back and did white mother of pearl inlays on. And it turned out spectacular. Well, just in doing the fretboard, he shattered probably four bits in cutting out the mother of pearl. But um, I, I've seen people do that. I don't know that that's the best way to do it. But this is one of those cases of um, whatever works. I mean, you know, if it works for you, then... Um, you know, what can you do? I mean, um, you know, just until your hand is better and you can hold it up while you're tightening the collet. Um, I don't see where a magnet would be a bad thing. I mean, if it keeps it in place, sure, why not? Try it. I mean, you don't have to wait for me to try this stuff. Uh, give it a shot. Um. Uh, now, it also depends on what you're talking about. If you're talking about a magnet up inside the taper, I'd be a little hesitant to do that. If you're talking about just kind of putting it up there and then sticking the magnet on to hold it, um, hold it in place, um, then that should work, you know. Um, see, Caroline came back with a uh, follow-up question, and, and I don't know if it's Caroline or Carolyn. I'm sorry for butchering your name but that's my thing. Um, she said, thanks. Is there other software to use? Oh boy. Yes. That's the short answer. Uh, the titles are all over the place, but, uh, as far as, um, I'm just going to say you get what you pay for. Okay. That's all I'm going to say. There are some dynamite free programs out there. I've never used them. Probably the number one program other than anything by Vectric is uh, Fusion 360. But I don't know how familiar you are um, with CAD work. Um, it's kind of similar to that, but it's more for making parts for assemblies and less about the artistic side um that's not to say it can't do that just that you have to go through more steps to do the same thing um there are other people that use um what is it uh, easel then there's carbide create uh it just depends on your your controller system and whether it's compatible with that controller Personally, I've never used, I've tried to use Fusion 360. Uh, I also signed up for and took a class 
to learn uh, SolidWorks. But they were more, again, focused on parts for assemblies. Like if you want to make a bunch of gears for um, an exposed gear wooden clock, Fusion 360 would be the way to go for that. And don't get me wrong, Fusion 360 is a dynamite program. Just for what I do, it's like trying to use a five-pound sledgehammer to drive a thumbtack. It's just way, way, way too big of a hammer for what I do. So, you know. But, yeah, there, there are other software brands out there, believe me. So let's see here. Um, okay. Uh, Ian Paling, I believe that is. Uh, thread milling toolpath. Uh, a while back, the jar lid, I made jar lids, yes, and glued the metal lids in the pocket. Have you ever thought about doing wooden lids with a thread mill in it to fit the jar? Maybe a rebate or rabbit if you're in the U.S., for the seal. I have, there are two things preventing me from doing that. Number one is I haven't 100% got the uh, thread milling tool path down. There is still a little bit of a, an issue for me. And it's just for me with uh, thread milling, um, the type of threads, be they Acme, flat top, regular 60 degree, 90 degree. You would need to know the thread pitch of the jar lid and all that other stuff, but all that could be worked out. The other disadvantage for me is wood moves. And it's all, excuse me, it's always going to move. And when you're talking about something like that particular project where it's in the kitchen, where humidity changes several times a day based on whether you're boiling a, a pot of pasta or you are just, you know, not cooking at all. Humidity changes are going to make that wood swell and then contract. And I can foresee if I did that, my wife coming in and will you open this ding dong thing for me? I can't get the jar lid off. So that was the number one reason why I didn't do it that way. Could I do it? Probably yes. But I figured by just gluing that lid ring into the top of the, uh, the jar lid cover, for lack of a better term, I would eliminate any of those possibilities. Because it's just simple. Wood is going to move. And also, if you looked at that video where I cut out the, uh, I actually cut them out and then glued those rings in, I didn't put any epoxy along the sides. I glued to the bottom of the uh, down in, well, the top of the ring. And then I oriented the grain so that I wasn't, I was allowing the wood to swell, expand and contract. It was glued kind of in the center so that the wood can expand and contract. And I wasn't trying to force it to stay there because I didn't want it to crack. So... Um, so basically, yeah, I could, I just didn't for a couple of reasons. Now I'm probably overthinking it, but you know, what can I say? Uh, let's see here. Um, so hopefully that answers that. So yes, you can do it. I just didn't. <laughs> Let's see here now. Rick French says, uh, in a spire with a cutout profile, is there a simple way of rounding the profile edge with a one eighth inch radius round over? Yes. Um, if you want to round over an edge, and I don't know if I have showed this in any of my videos or not. I know I have done chamfered edges in my videos, but I don't know if I've done a round over. I'll have to go back and look, Rick. I'm not 100% certain. Um, the um, For a roundover, I, it should work the same as a chamfer. And that is, and do preview 
early preview often on this. What I do is I select the vector. I use the same vector I'm going to use for a profile cutout. And I'll use a 90 degree V-bit for the chamfer. And I have it mill to a specific depth. Like if I'm going to do a 90 degree chamfer, I might go an eighth of an inch uh, cut depth and have it machine on the vector. Then preview that and that just, it cuts a one eighth inch deep with that 90 degree V bit. And that gives me a chamfer on that edge. Round over should be the same. You might have to try outside the vector versus on the vector, but preview early, preview often. The hard part is figuring out your depth. And that's what the preview is good for. Just keep adjusting the depth and adjusting the position until you find that sweet spot. I find that just slightly above the Mac, the radius of the tool. So for instance, if you're, you're looking at uh, a one eighth inch radius round over, um, I would make the depth of cut instead of 0.125, I would go say 0.123 just so it doesn't, if there's any variation in the surface, you're not leaving that ledge. It like, it looks like you cut too deep because I can go back around and I can sand that little bit of a round over. But if it's cut too deep, that's a lot more sanding I have to do to get rid of that. But yes, it's very possible. I, and the reason I kind of hesitated at first was I think I demonstrated that in one of my form tool videos. Let me, let me look at it. And this may take a while, but by tomorrow, by tomorrow, if I did demonstrate that in that uh, in that roundover video, I'll link it in this video. Um, I do I need to demonstrate that a lot more often and possibly make a uh, a video out of that uh, a separate video out of that. So um, let's see. Uh, let's see here. Okay. Rick says chamfered is an offset with the angled bit. I was looking to use a tapered ball nose. Oh, oh, I get it. I thought you meant a eighth inch radius round over bit center point cutting round over bit. I get it now. Um, uh, me as well. Uh, Jeff says he uses a point cutting round over bit. I do too. And that's why I went there. Uh, I didn't realize you meant with a, uh, with a, uh, eighth inch tapered ball nose. Um, you can do that. If you're using a spire, you can, uh, program that, uh, round over in there real easy. Um, you would, um, let's see, I would, uh, you know, I'll do a video on that. Uh, round over in 3D. I'll do a video on it. It's too much to do right here, right now. Rick French, thank you very much. I do appreciate the super chat. You are a champion, my friend. I really appreciate that. Um, let's see here. Um, okay, yeah. See, I thought you were talking about doing it with a round over bit. That's how I do it. Um well, that's part of it, Rick. You do need to get the right bit, but you can also do it as part of 3D. Now, again, it takes longer to do that. I mean, you might be adding, well, depending upon how technical you want to get, you might be adding an hour to your machine times, whereas an eighth-inch roundover bit um, would take just a few seconds, you know, because it's just cutting that... Uh, profile tool path and done usually one maybe two passes so um i will i will uh get into it uh in a video i don't know why i haven't done before okay let's see brooks martin says can you modify those trial files and generate g-code 
if it says it's trial friendly. Yes. If it's the tr free trial friendly. Now, not all of those files are. So you do have to look for that. And um, they did that with, I, I think there's like a dozen different projects in that uh, collection of the free monthly projects that are um, trial compatible. Because they do want you to be able to go out and cut something to make sure you like your software on your, like their software on your machine. So, but yes, you can modify them. Like I've seen people take those paradise boxes and they have a floral carving in the center in a circle. Well, people have gone in and modified it and they've taken that floral pattern out and put in a name or another 3D carving or something like that. So they're completely ed editable, just like any other project. So, so the short answer, yes. Okay, let's see here. Uh, Larry Stoss, Stas, Stoss, okay. Uh, says, when using the vector validator, what or how much important is placed on intersections? And what's the best way to address intersections? I demonstrated that uh, in a video about the vector validator. And I will link that in the description of this video when I get finished. And um, the short answer is basically if you have an intersection, and intersections are different from overlaps. An intersection may prevent a V-carve or a pocket from cutting in the right location. Okay. You have, it's, it's, again, it's not an overlap, but it would interfere with a pocket or a V-carve toolpath. So your best bet is to get rid of those intersections. Um, how much importance is placed on them? Quite a bit. That's why it identifies them. So you can go in and fix them. What's the best way to address them? There, sometimes there is no best way. You will have to modify those vectors in one way or another to either, you can either weld them together. You can move points by going into uh, node editing mode and pulling them apart so that they don't cross. It just depends on what the intersection is and what's being carved. I mean, if it's something that is going to be 3D carved, but then you have V carving that goes up into that 3D model, you definitely need to pull it out of there. You know, um, if you have a square that sits on top, one edge sits on top of another square, you need to separate them slightly or weld them together. So there are various ways of handling them, but I demonstrate them in the vector validator video. And like I said, as soon as we're finished live here, I'll go ahead and put a link to that video in the description of this video. So you can check that out. So, and I hope that answers your question. Let's see here, go back over here to your comments uh yeah jeff j and j love dance uh says he's done roundovers with a ball nose bit and the molding tool path i have two uh but i have found that it's just basically a lot cl quicker so uh let's see here um and yeah uh, i all pay leg uh, I agree with you. Eventually, a roundover bit will produce better results because it has the right curvature. Yes, you just have to you just have to be careful of where you're putting that roundover versus the diameter of the bit. Now, last week I said I was going to bring some bits over here, and I promptly forgot to do that. Oh well. Um, if you have a one eighth inch um, roundover bit that runs a one eighth inch radius but the bit is a half inch in diameter and that would be too close to something that stands up on a 3d model. 
you might run into it. There might be some interference there. So you do have to be careful of that. In instances where you have relief that close to the edge you're wanting to round over, your better bet is to apply that round over using either the molding tool path or you can use a, um, um, you can get into your modeling tools and create it. So uh, let's see here. Um, get back over here to the starred videos and let's see. John Thompson said, did you know your friend Rob Sands Sandstrom put out a free download for V-bits with the cut for depth of cut for epoxy inlays? You can get it by emailing. Yes, I did know that. If you, if, well, if you're interested in epoxy inlays, and you're not subscribed to Rob, first of all, shame on you. Second of all, do so. Uh, that man has more information on doing epoxy inlays than I have learned yet. I'm, I refer to his videos often. And yes, uh, check out his epoxy inlay videos because John is absolutely right. He does have a free download for V-bits for the width of cut and the depth of cut for creating epoxy inlays. And it, he's a very, very good resource and he's very good at what he does. So definitely go check him out. I'll put a link to his uh, uh, channel down in the description of this video when, as soon as we're done live here. Okay, let's see here. Uh, Dan McKnight wants to know, is there a way to have the roughing tool path carve a little further out when using the molding tool path. The finishing bit always ends up carving the full depth on the sides, if that makes sense. Um, let me check my facts here. Um, before we get into it, let's go ahead and go back over to Aspire. And let's find out. Uh, if I go over here to the molding tool path, which is right there, uh, D, 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 machining allowance. There it is right there. And a, no, excuse, uh, yes, for the clearance tool, use a machining allowance. I usually use about 20 to 30 thousandths. Then down here, boundary offset okay if you need your let me turn off automatic boundary offset and put in an offset here if for instance you are using um an eighth inch end mill i use a boundary offset of the bit cutting diameter. So if I'm using a, right here, I'm using a quarter inch ball nose, I will enter a boundary offset 0.25. That will make the bit cut its diameter beyond the model, the material, or the vector. Okay. And Preview early, preview often, as I say, because that may not be the effect that you're looking for. But a boundary offset is the way to get that to cut beyond just a little bit further out. Okay? And if you're talking about in the, in the roughing only, I don't know that you can I don't know that you can set a boundary offset for the roughing only. Um cuz both of them are going to do this. Just, you know, preview pre preview early, preview often. Uh, and I can't stress that enough. That's what it's for. Um but boundary offset is usually the way I go about that. So All right, let me go ahead and close that down and we will 
stop sharing and get back to other questions. And I hope that answers your question, Dan. So let's go back over here. And Thomas Howie Kitchens says, where can I import new tools data uh, from to upload to vCarve Pro, please? From the bit manufacturer. That's your number one source because they know what they make. They know the profile best. Excuse me. <clears throat> Boy, that was rough. Um, there are, I, I've done several videos on how to add tools to the tool database and some of them, for instance, an end mill, an end mill is an end mill and end is an end mill, uh, a quarter inch end mill or a six millimeter end mill, the manufacturer, it doesn't matter. Uh, up cut down cut. It doesn't matter. Just copy one that is similar in size change the cutting parameters, and there you go. If you're looking at form tools, go to that bits manufacturer and ask them for either a tool file for Vectric or a CAD drawing of the profile. And then you can use that CAD drawing to import it into VCarve and... Um, you only need the right side, so you'll eliminate the left side and, uh, you know, edit the vector and use that to uh, import the data into uh, VCarve Pro. Now, let me also say, be very, very careful about using their feed speeds and uh cutting depths even the manufacturers themselves will tell you on a tool file or in their specifications or anything else that any of those parameters are starting points only manufacturers have to cater to every industry those feed rates those spindle rpms and those cutting depths are set for industrial machines. Very, very few manufacturers, and I can only think of one right off the top, two right off the top of my head, that engineer them with hobby machines in mind. And that is um, Cadence. Uh, if you know Cody, Cadence Manufacturing, uh, who makes the uh, Jenny bit? I love that bit. Eight six seven five three zero nine is the part number, and he named the bit Jenny. Come on, what's not to love about that? Um, he manufactures bits with hobby machines in mind, and uh, so does R. So does RIP Precision Bits. He manufactures bits with hobby machines in mind. Now. The difference in, you know, these bits is subtle. Like the Jenny bit is a compression bit, but it's how much of the bottom of that compression bit has to be buried in the material to get past that upcut portion. It's that amount is smaller than on any of the other compression bits. Again, they're engineered for industrial machines. Your home hobby machine may not be capable of running a bit at 300 inches per minute in one pass through three quarter inch plywood. Mine isn't. So using their feed rates, using their spindle RPMs and using their cutting depths, there has to be a number in there. It's it, There can't be a blank in those fields. So they put in what they engineer them for, and you have to adjust from there. So if you're downloading a tool file or you're entering criteria into uh, your tool database, be very careful about running somebody else's uh, numbers. Be very careful. So uh, 
JR over at Trade Skillers Anonymous, thank you very much for the super chat. Uh, I really, really appreciate it. Thank you. And there's somebody else to go check out on YouTube, Trade Skillers Anonymous. And not just because he had me on his, uh, his uh, live stream, but because he genuinely is a good guy and he knows what he's talking about. Um, and, you know, I, I know a lot of people in the uh, home hobby CNC um, community, I guess you would say. He's really got to be the most enthusiastic that I've ever had the chance to talk with. I mean, he loves this stuff and you can tell just by the way he presents himself, by the way he carries himself. He is into this. <laughs> so <laughs> he's a good guy. He's got some great content over there. In fact, I will link his channel down in the description of this video as soon as we're finished here live. Speaking of that, which we've been on for an hour, it is time to go ahead and wrap this up. Um, I will get you real quick how to make an oval lampshade. Okay. Uh, how can I create text with a V bit followed by an end mill so that the text depth can be shallow but large? That's called v carving to a flat depth that is the part three of my v carving for absolute beginner series that link the link to the playlist for that series is already in the description of this video go to that playlist and you want to look at uh part three of that series v carving to a flat depth and that'll tell you everything you need to know. Makes perfect sense exactly how you put it. Interesting channel name, by the way. Okay, uh, we need to go ahead and wrap this up. If there's anything else, any other questions you have, I will definitely be back next week, whether I have the shelf project finished or not. Uh, again, that's kind of waiting on any number of things, mostly my shop time. It's like today, for instance, I know I haven't done a shop uh, update in a while. Today, for instance, I have to hook up my trailer and go over to my sister-in-law's house and pick up a metal cabinet that I'm storing paint, stain, and all that other good stuff in here. So I won't get any shop time this afternoon. <sighs> and various and sundry other, sundry other things. So, um, you are very welcome. Your luck getting on in time. Yes, it was. You snuck under the wire, so, <laughs> so to speak. But hey, and this goes to everybody out there who says, well, your feed, it's not coming over the feed or any. We're here every Sunday, 12 o'clock Pacific, 3 p.m. Eastern. Unless I'm having a special guest that has a uh, scheduling conflict, then I'll adjust. But we're here every Sunday, whether I have a video or not, for live Q&As. Noon Pacific, 3 p.m. Eastern. Come join us. So uh, let's go ahead and wrap this up. I got some big changes coming here in the background. That's another thing that I'm working on. I've got this project going. I've got the epoxy project going. I'm going to have to buy another computer uh, because the one I want to use out here will not work. It's not got enough resources. So you guys have a good week. Hope this week goes well for you. And until next week, Y'all take care. Now get out there and do something cool. Go make some chips. This is supposed to be fun, remember? Take care, y'all. Have a good one.